Hello and welcome to another episode of Starside Chat. I am one of your hosts, Aaron, and with me as always is Zach. How's it going, Zach? Good. Hopefully uh, you survived the storms and the crazy heat. Yes, it's been not great weather the past couple of days where we're at. Pretty hot, and then we just had some pretty crazy storms, but it seems pretty okay. I mean, there's definitely some down trees where I'm at, but uh, how are you faring over there? Uh, not too bad. I mean, the the storm definitely brought the temperatures down a little bit today, yeah. so it, it's not as hot and humid as it has been over the past week, but good to finally not have, like, mid-90s <laughs> <laughs> with, like, heat indexes of over 100. <laughs> yeah, not great. But speaking of things that are hot, we got some hot game news to talk about. We do. So I don't know if you saw this, but the PlayStation Project Q leaked uh, this last week. And uh, there were some actual videos of somebody who had gotten a hold of one. And it's like, it's not great footage. And like the the guy didn't even take the screen protector off that like I assume yeah. comes uh, like in the box. And normally you would just peel it off, but he just left it on there. And so it's like super bubbly. But, I was not uh, expecting it to be so thin. Yeah, I mean, it's basically if you took a PS5 controller and you split it in half and where the touchpad would have gone, you just replaced it with like a seven inch tablet, mm-hmm. Android tablet, because it is basically running Android is what it, uh, this shows, which I think has some people excited because they're going to be able to like, you know, do whatever they want with it, basically uh, turn it into something other than just a, a PlayStation uh, cloud gaming controller, basically. And, but, I mean, everybody else is disappointed that <laughs> it is a cloud controller and not, like, you know, PlayStation's version of the Switch or, like, a new uh, PlayStation Portable console of some sort. Um, but, I, I mean, I get it. It's one of those things where they have sort of struggled with their... Uh, their mobile sort of PlayStation Portable line for a long time. They've never been able to keep up with Nintendo. Mm-hmm. And, but especially these days where you've got the Switch and the Steam Deck and a bunch of other like PC uh, portable gaming devices, um, people do like to just like, especially if you have like your family around and you want to, you don't want to be off in some room playing your PS5 somewhere. You could be sitting on the couch, hanging out with your family, and just pull out your little cloud streaming device and just play the game uh, yeah. and, and still be there. But So I get it. I get the use case for it, but I do agree with everyone else that this should have just been like its own. It should have been a Steam Deck, but instead of running Steam, it ran you know, Sony's proprietary PlayStation software and gave you basically access to the library i mean i don't know how they do that necessarily because well actually they still could it would probably be more expensive but i mean you figure they've ported god of war and horizon to pc and like the spider-man games and i assume i think most of those run fine on the steam deck but I mean, you can buy, there's a number of, uh, like, small form factor factor portable gaming devices that you can emulate PS2 games on. So there's no reason they couldn't just make an official version of that. Yeah. And, I mean, if nothing else, uh, most of Sony's PS5 games are also on PS4. And so if nothing else, you could just have it run... PS4 games and then yeah. if you wanted like a PS5 game it could stream that you know it could still it could still do both things but that is not the direction they've gone unfortunately so I, I mean it's I, also I, crazy to me that it is I know I said this already but it's like so thin and I wonder if they're putting form over functionality like I want I, I wonder what the battery life is on this thing because it seems like it's not going to have that big of a battery if it is that thin. Like, they could have chunked it out a little bit and just, like, this is good for, you know, 12 hours or something. But I don't know. Yeah, and I've never used my phone to do the streaming for, 
Like, I know you can do that. I, I did it a couple of times. How did it work? Like, was it It was solid? fine. I mean, all I did was really play... This was back when I was playing Destiny 2. So I would, like, hop on there, and I had, like, a little Bluetooth controller, and would just, like, run around and do some daily stuff. But it did... I mean, I'm trying to remember what phone I had when I was doing this. Um, it might have been my Pixel 3a. So, I mean, it's not, like, a top-of-the-line flagship, but it did burn through the battery. Yeah, I assume it would do that. Also, I you had a... Uh, a Vita, right? Yeah, and I did the exact same thing with that. And that was a much better experience, actually. And the battery lasted a great amount of time. Um, I didn't really... I pretty much only bought that... I, I found that Vita for, like, crazy cheap at a Video Games Etc. Uh, and I bought it solely for the purpose of playing Destiny while I was, like, away. And it worked great. It was... uh, It worked totally fine. There was a little bit of a delay, but I wasn't doing, like super precise stuff so i didn't really need it to be like i couldn't play esports on it basically sure but um yeah it was super solid yeah i think basically what people wanted from this was a new version of the vita where instead of having its own like proprietary line of games that uh, were built specifically for the portable device this just like you could download games from the playstation store and they would basically be ps4 and possibly some PS5 games and just run mm-hmm. those on this device as opposed to having to stream them. But um, I still think it's a little bit cool nonetheless. Uh, I, don't, I do too. I think it's cool. But we'll see how it actually runs games and whatnot once it finally actually comes out, which I don't actually know. When, when is this thing supposed to come out? Is there a release date? I'm not sure. There might not be. I know it's fairly expensive. Like, I think it's over $300. I could be wrong. But I last time I saw it, I thought it was that. But uh, PlayStation don't. loves to make weird, super expensive accessories, like that PSVR 2 that's, yeah. like, more expensive than the console. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. I, I mean, I'm not big on VR, and I, I know, like... Some people are think some of the stuff that PlayStation has released for PSVR, even like the old PSVR one, like was pretty cool. Uh, but I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sold on it enough to spend that much money on it. So here's something I did over the past week. I went to an arcade. Oh yeah. IRL, and uh, I played a VR title at the arcade. Which one? I don't remember what it was called, but it was crazy because. You walk up to it and you like swipe your card and uh, the it's a shooting game. So like the gun is like suspended above you. And then when you swipe your card, it comes down on a cable to be like eye height. Interesting. So then you pick it up and like you hold the gun up to your shoulder or whatever, like you would with a real gun. And the like goggles are like built into the gun. So you're like your face is up against the gun. And then you're kind of like moving the gun around to shoot people. And then the the machine itself uh, on the wall or whatever has a screen so that everyone can see what you're doing. Um, but it was pretty cool. You can, you like, you know, there were people coming at me with like axes and stuff. I don't, I have no memory of what it was called, but uh, it was pretty cool. Some months ago, I did go to a, a barcade uh, and they didn't have anything like that. I mean, they had like gun arcade games, but not like the VR ones. But uh, they did have a couple of Nintendo ones. Like, they had a Mario Kart one where you'd actually, like, sit in the cart, basically, and Mm -hmm. drive around. And they had uh, that Cruise and Blast game as well. Oh, yeah. So that was cool to see. it. Like, I I love Cruise and World back in the day on the the 64. And (laughs) I I played a bunch of it when the Cruise and Blast came to Switch. But to actually, like, get the arcade experience, which... I didn't really get when I was a kid when like Cruising USA and Cruising World were out there in the the old arcade cabinets. I never really got a chance to play it, but as an adult, I made good on that and played uh, Cruising <laughs> Blast. So, um, did you get a chance to see any of these Armored Core uh, yeah previews that came out? A bunch of videos came out. A bunch of YouTubers got access. Um, how do you do you like the look of this? I mean, you're sort of a you're our Souls expert now. Uh, and it's, <laughs> this is not a Souls game, but I mean, from is making this. Is this interesting to you? Um, I I don't know. I'm a little bit like you where I'm not su- super big on like uh ro- like robot or 
mech games. Um, I will say it does seem faster than mech games I've seen in the past. Like yeah. to watch watching these like combat gameplay videos, it does seem like you're jumping around pretty quickly, which it was my main criticism of previous mech games that I was I've seen. But I don't know; it's still not really clicking for me. Yeah. Um, I, on the one hand, I, I trust from software to like make something cool and quite good. And it, I, it does a little bit just kind of look like a third person action game, kind of akin to something even like Final Fantasy 16 that I just have been playing where you're, you know, you can lock onto your target and you can sort of strafe around them and you're like attacking them. And I assume you have different abilities that you can do. Um, but it, it does, like you said, it looks much faster paced than some of the other uh, mech games that we've seen in the past. Uh, what Do you remember that one that came out on Switch that was like a Switch exclusive? Yeah. What was I do that called? That. I, have no, I have no idea what that was called, but that was like early on, right? Yeah. I was even tempted to pick that one up because it, I thought it did look cool. Like it had a cool art style to it, but I, I was a it little bit- It was like bit, all monochromatic, right? It was like red and black. Yeah. I, w- I was very curious about that. Oh, Damon X Machina? Is, does that sound right? That, that sounds sound familiar like to me, thing? yeah. Anyway, it was something like that. But that I thought that game looked cool, but I never got around to playing it. Um, that was sort of the first time I was like, you know what? I could play a mech game. I don't know. <laughs> so maybe I haven't played any of the previous Armored Core games. but uh, Nor have I. But yeah, interesting that they're returning to an older franchise and sort of going away from the whole Soulsborne thing, which is like, that's what they're known for. You just kind of expect that that's what they're going to do but yeah uh interesting to get something different maybe they'll pull in an even bigger audience with this uh than could be because they'll probably win the the soulsborne people anyway because it's from software and they'll be like yep i'm just going to play whatever they make and then you'll probably have the people who are like i'm not really into the difficulty of the soulsborne games this is something different let me try that so yeah it, it could do pretty well Zach, have you ever wanted to play as Nicki Minaj in Warzone? Can't say I have. It's I. So this is happening, and I guess in reading this article, I didn't realize this, but other celebrities have been coming to Warzone. Like, they added Snoop Dogg to Warzone uh, previously, <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah, because normally you get, uh, like, fictional char- characters. Like, we were talking about how they had added characters from the boys so like homelander and black noir and starlight were added i think i do think this month that like the reason one of the reasons that fortnite is still going strong is because of like brand integration like this yeah like you can play as you know naruto or the doom slayer i think throwing like people like recognizable people into these places is a cool idea and just weird uh, and I think Warzone is maybe picking up on that and being like, yeah, like I, I would, it would be crazy to see in the aesthetics of Warzone, like an anime character, like if they yeah. added someone from like Jujutsu Kaisen or something. Um, it would look like that one. What was that like Shonen Jump game that looked really weird? Oh, yeah, it would look like, man, it would be crazy if you could play as the guy from One Piece in Warzone. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I get the strategy because it's like, oh, this is a famous person that people know, and they're so it'll like draw people in. But it is a weird thing to think about as instead of like a fictional character that's like, oh, Spider Man is here now. I want to play as Spider Man. It's just like Nicki Minaj. <laughs> it's like when they added to that Dead by Daylight, they added just Nicolas Cage instead of one of his yeah. characters. It yeah, was exactly. like just the actor Nicolas Cage. Yeah, this isn't a, a particular character he he played. This is just Nicolas Cage like I don't understand that <laughs> it's interesting yeah I just I thought it was really weird um I guess I have not really I mean Warzone has always been something I haven't really checked out because it is like so big to throw on a hard drive um yeah which by the way I heard that uh Baldur's Gate 3 is also like a massive download oh really I'm getting a lot of Baldur's Gate 3 content on like TikTok and YouTube recommended to me because it's like about to pop off are you what's your uh hype level, level for that game are you interested in it 
Uh, a little bit, because I did play some of Divinity Original Sin 2, and I liked what I played of that game. I never finished it or, like, really, like, spent a significant amount yeah, of time. Yeah, I didn't probably, either. I probably put, like, 15, 20 hours into it, but, um, I, I mean, I've heard a lot of good things about Baldur's Gate 3, and I, to be honest, if this were on Stadia, <laughs> so that yeah. you didn't have to download that massive file... It's a little bit of a bummer that Stadia went away. This is another one of those instances where it would be originally nice to have. the first trailer was on Stadia, right? Yeah, it was originally. I, I don't know if it was like a timed exclusive or not on that that beta that they released, but um, yeah, it, they were definitely uh, all in on Stadia because that was where their reveal was. But yeah, I, I think it's a cool game. I'm not sure if I will play it. Is the is what I'm kind of coming down to. Yeah, I. I don't love that. I mean, I played Baldur's Gate 2 a ton when I was a kid because, you know, when you're a kid, you only have so many games and you just play them over and over again. Yeah. And Baldur's Gate 2 was another one of those half price books games where I would go there and buy a big cardboard box of a video game from like the video game section for like 50% off or whatever. Um, and I played Baldur's Gate 2 a ton. I played it so much. And I, then I found out how to do cheats with it and I would do that as well. But I don't know. I I didn't think I would be interested in it, but everyone is talking about it so much. It's something that I might actually check out. That happens to me a lot where I'll be like, mm, I don't know about this game. And then like over the course of like the weeks before release, they, there's just so much hype behind yeah. it that it just like ends up having this huge amount of momentum just before it releases. And then I get swept up in it and I end up buying it. I, I that hasn't happened with uh, Baldur's Gate 3 for me yet anyway, but uh, I think it's going to be a really long game, too. <laughs> is the I other think it's thing. probably, it might be a contender for game of the year. I'm sure it will be. For for the people that play it, I'm sure it's going to be up there. I, I have gotten a little bit more into, like, tactics-based, uh, like, RPGs. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that I could play that game and really get into it, but... It's not typically the kind of game I look for, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I would be very curious to hear your impressions if you do pick it up. We'll, well see. Uh, we'll would see you play what's it on PC? On. Oh, yeah. I would, I would definitely play it on PC. Yeah, um, it's, it seems like a PC release for sure. I got to use my, my clicking, my mouse and keyboard. Yeah. Speaking of games that uh, you could be playing on PC, Final Fantasy XIV, which is, I think... Well, no, that's is that on PlayStation Five or PlayStation Four? Uh, I was gonna I'm say you sure. would think of it as a PC game because it's an MMO, but it is coming to Xbox. Was the, going the strong. latest news? Yeah, this is the MMO version of Final Fantasy that people are love now and are super into. I guess they're coming out with a big expansion, and they're also incorporating. There's a new mini game that is like a Fall Guys type of mini game. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> where you're just like running through gauntlets and doing things. But yeah, it's also coming to Xbox in the spring. So you can finally play this on Xbox Series S and X. I mean, they're getting more of the Final Fantasy stuff. Uh, I, it, everybody's like, when is Final Fantasy VII Remake coming to Xbox? Yeah. And will Final Fantasy XVI come to Xbox? Uh, this is one of those things where you feel like Sony might try to buy square enix just to prevent the the stuff going to xbox because they i mean they've had a good relationship with square enix for a long time Mm -hmm. and that's why they get these like timed exclusive deals on like final fantasy games and uh i mean i don't necessarily love that but it is like one of their big sellers so (laughs) it'll be interesting to see it on xbox uh just because i don't normally think of when i think of final fantasy i think i just automatically associate that with playstation but yeah um do you have any interest in final fantasy 14 not particularly i watched a series of videos a long long time ago back before they like fixed it because there initially when it came out there were a lot of problems with it similar i think to like uh eso ESO or like uh, Fallout 76 where sure. 
it launched and people were just like, all of these quests are taking too long and did anyone even play test this? This is awful. And eventually they were like, we need to revamp this. We need to do like a 2.0 or whatever. And now people are obsessed with it. Um, but I have never really been an MMO. I've, I've wanted to get into an MMO because I think it's a, a fun, interesting kind of thing. But I don't know. It's, it's not the gameplay of it all is just not super enticing to me. Like, I don't feel like the rewards you get are what I want from a game. The only um, one I've been able to get into is ESO. And I, I play that like a single player game. Because they yeah. do such a good job of having like you know fully voiced dialogue and these like long quest lines, and it is like each uh, DLC release is basically like a thirty hour campaign, and so if you like Oblivion and Skyrim, you can jump into ESO and basically play it like it's one of those games and just sort mm. of ignore the MMO trappings of it and still get a solid like Elder Scrolls experience out of it. And so basically that's the only one I, I've played because it offers something close to a, a single player Elder Scrolls experience. But I don't know if that's the case with Final Fantasy fourteen. I don't know either. I the series of videos I watched back in the day before it was fixed was just like basically talking about how awful it was. It was a guy from an old YouTube channel that I used to watch, basically showing his friend all of the ways that like they needed to level up in order to complete this quest. And it was just like crazy how unintuitive it was <laughs> and how long it took. But I know people love it now. So I, don't I was going to say it's, it's been going strong for a number of years now. Yeah. And I think people are very hot on Final Fantasy 14. So, uh, but games out this week. Um, I, one that I didn't put on here because it didn't come out this week, but I feel like I've heard a lot of people talking about it this week. I don't know if there was like a recent update to it was that Halls of Torment game, which is a uh, vampire survivors like I don't. Did we ever settle what we're calling those uh, survivor likes? Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Bullet hell something, but reverse bullet hell, reverse bullet hell. But uh no, it, th- this one has sort of a an early Diablo aesthetic to it, and there's like a bunch of RPG mechanics to it uh, that you're leveling up and all of that, and it is getting overwhelmingly positive reviews. It's still in early access, and it's like five bucks, but I think it is also uh, Steam Deck compatible. And uh, it looks good. I, I, this is really the only survivors like that i have seen that i've been actually tempted to play i feel like we've (laughs) seen a bunch of these uh over the last like year or two and i'm always like yeah but i mean if i really want this experience i'll just play more vampire survivors which they've added a ton to they keep adding to that game yeah that game is still going strong too but um but yeah this is the first one that i've seen that i've actually been tempted to try but uh, I have not as of yet. But anyway, uh, another game that came out this last week that people have been playing is a Remnant 2. Have you got a chance to see any of this? No, it's actually it's not something that's been on my radar. Yeah, it's. I, I don't know if you saw a Remnant from the Ashes, which was the first one. But they're basically uh, trying to combine uh, a cooperative experience like borderlands with like the souls like experience of you know you're going around and finding these places where you can rest and then you have these yes. big, these big boss fights um but i do remember this because there's like a there's a class where you have like a dog with you yeah and so it's it's a third person shooter version of a souls like which is kind of interesting but uh yeah it has that sort of uh cooperative thing that uh where you you have a different class and you're you're playing in co-op that uh, something like Borderlands offers, uh, which is an interesting little like combo, and I think that's mm-hmm. why it's uh, done fairly well. I think the reviews are pretty solid. I I kind of don't think this is gonna hold up uh, by we by the time we get to the end of the year in terms of like mm-hmm. game of the year talk, but it's yeah. a it seems like a solid game. 
I just, I don't know if I need more Souls-like stuff in my life right now. <laughs> so it's I have interesting that really... it's a shooter Souls-like. Yeah, that, I think that's the the real novelty here is that it, instead of it being sort of a medieval sword and sorcery style um, Souls-like game, it's a third-person shooter. Uh, it seems like mechanically really good too, where like you're able to to dodge roll and you get like the invincibility frames that you kind of expect with a, a game like that, but you're you're shooting enemies from a distance, and then I think there might be like some melee weapons in there as well, but mostly you're you're doing uh, third person shooter stuff, mm-hmm. and I'm curious about like the co op uh, if that makes it easier or harder or if they're like scaling things uh based on how many people are playing i think you can play Mm -hmm. up to three players but uh anyway it seems like a solid game uh but not something i'm necessarily into uh same for the next one disney illusion island that i think that came out on friday this is it looks kind of like my first metroidvania kind of a thing that's a good that's a very apt there's no combat to it you are just like uh, jumping around and avoiding enemies and it looks like both in its art style and and its gameplay it looks a little bit like rayman but mm. instead of it being level based it's sort of structured like a metroidvania and uh this would be one of those games where if like you had a kid and you wanted to play something in co-op with them you could totally do that with this game and probably have a pretty good time because mm-hmm. um, it's like not super hard and you can um sort of introduce them to the metroidvania genre in a a, a sort of friendly family friendly sort of way so uh that i believe is exclusive to the switch as well yes Um, it is did you get a chance to see any of the the expanse a telltale series that came out no um i forgot this was coming out this week but well, so it's only the first chapter. They they re- release them oh, episodically. Yeah. So if you uh, would rather wait until you had all the content available and like everybody sort of knew what to expect with it, I believe like late September they'll be done releasing. I think there's like maybe five episodes. I'm not entirely sure, but um, I, I love the expanse. Uh, this yeah. this I think it's a prequel a little bit um based on what i've seen but you're you're playing as a drummer yeah uh who is a pretty cool character from the show and they got the the voice actress playing her to come on for the uh for the game and I, i'm not super huge on these like telltale style of game i agree there there was a time where it was like novel and interesting but i also don't love the episodic nature of it where you're like mm like a tv show like i don't watch a lot of episodic tv typically i will wait for a season to end before i start watching mm-hmm. and i would do the same if i planned on playing this but i don't know i don't know if i will play it even though i love the expanse which i think is a great show everybody should watch i also think it's a great show and i love the expanse i don't i'm not super into the belters because i sometimes can't yeah. understand what they're saying um That's i feel like this is gonna be a lot of people talking about talking in like belter slang or whatever yeah yeah but definitely because uh, you're you're following uh drummer and she's a belter and she's yeah. like her crew is a bunch of belters so yeah that would definitely be the case but it's um, cool i'm i'm all about more stories in the expanse i am on the precipice of finishing the series and i would love to have more of it so maybe i will check this out i don't know yeah maybe wait until all the episodes are out and it's like gotten some reviews and then check it out yeah um the other one this isn't uh, a release from this last week it might have been oh well maybe it was it was the 21st i think was uh pikmin 4 which you said you've been playing a little bit of i've played a little bit beyond what i had played in the beta uh, your progress carries over and yeah i i really enjoy it i think this is it could be a, a top 10 game for me it could be, be even possibly a top five game for me it's of the year or ever of the year um because it it's just really fun to like go around and like in a, a fairly chill 
environment and just like collect items and things like that uh i know like it might get a little bit more difficult as it goes but like it's sort of nintendo's version of a real-time strategy game where instead of like sort of the top-down god view and you have like a little cursor that you're moving around you're actually playing as a character Mm. and so you're just sort of assigning your your pikmin to do different tasks for you and you're running around and uh grabbing collectibles and things like that and maybe defeating some enemies and then uh you sort of have this like overworld uh they're they're sort of open zone style areas that you go around to and you collect a bunch of items and you may take out some enemies and then they have these like little warp pipes that you basically go down uh, which is a very nintendo thing to do and those are not timed at all like there's no day timer at all when you're down there and they just sort of hand wave that whole situation and just go oh time works differently when you're down there don't worry about it and um yeah, those are, I heard somebody, I forget who it was, talking about Pikmin on a podcast, and they, they likened it to the shrines in Zelda. I was like, yeah, that's a that's a oh. fairly good description, because it, it's less puzzly and a little bit more like, how are you going to get around? And there is some, like, some of them that have some puzzle elements to it, like, how do I lower these uh, bars that are blocking my path, or how do I... Uh, get from point A to point B and uh, you have to use Ochi and the different uh, Pikmin to figure out how to do that and you have some enemies to take out and you're collecting items down there as well and uh, yeah it's just it's been very fun very chill so far and it's been a kind of a nice palate cleanser for me from uh, Final Fantasy 16 uh, which I have finished we can talk more about that later but uh, but yeah I'm really enjoying what I've played so far with Pikmin 4 um, do you have any interest whatsoever in Pikmin? Not really. Um, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, it's just not doing it for me. Um, See, I thought that until I played the demo. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, this is what Pikmin is. And I was like, yeah, that's... I could play a lot of this. And so I played a lot. <laughs> I'm going to probably play a lot of it before I'm done. But I'm interested say- to hear... I would say check out that demo for sure. Is the demo still up? I believe so. Yeah. We're we're back in the age of demos. Like it has returned. (laughs) There was like a Final Fantasy 16 demo that I got to play. Like a lot of games are doing demos now and I think it's awesome. So that's what I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on since you have completed Final Fantasy 16. Is it something that's going to land in our game of the year builder? Yes. Um, I, I thought I already put it in there. Maybe I didn't update the the uh, the doc that we have with our Game of the Year watch, but I slotted it in at number two behind uh, Tears Whoa. of the Kingdom, and I think it will stay there until uh, Starfield, Starfield comes out, <laughs> and then it could slip to three. But yeah, I I really liked it. It does those like big story beats so very well i know like some people have complained about like the side quests uh being not super interesting i don't think i agree with that i think i can understand from a gameplay perspective why it's like oh you just have to go kill some enemies and it's like well the main thing you do in a in this type of a game is the combat so of course they're gonna that's what they're gonna have you do is combat but like from a story perspective they they do a pretty good job of like fleshing out the world and the characters and a lot of those side quests have a sort of multiple stages to them and they sort of build uh, throughout the course of the game. And uh, towards the end, they, they will get like some sort of conclusion. And I think they did a good job of like carrying those through. And a lot of the character, there are a lot of characters in the game and I liked what they did with those characters. So I, mm-hmm. I liked quite a bit of the, the characters in the game. And I like the combat a lot, too. I thought it was really fun. There's, uh, like, seven different icons that you get. Uh, icons spelled E-I-K-O-N or something weird like that. Not, not, like, icon like I-C-O-N. It's, like, a weird Final Fantasy version of that word. But, um, but yeah, they each have different uh, abilities and things like that. And you can only take 
three of them with you at a time. And so you're swapping them out and trying out different combinations and you, you get ability points as well that you can use to uh, upgrade each of the, the different attacks and abilities that you can unlock. And if you upgrade them a second time, that masters them and then you can start mixing and matching. So you can have like Ooh. the ability from say like the fire icon with the, but use it on the, uh, like the wind icon or whatever. And so you can sort of mix and match that way, which I thought was pretty fun. And uh, there were some challenge levels to do as well. I, I basically did everything. I completed all the side quests. Wow. Um, I I was going to platinum the game, but you have to do a second playthrough to get all of the trophies. Oh, that and, sucks. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite ready for that yet. When So when you finish the game, you unlock uh, New Game Plus mode. And New Game Plus mode has the option for Final Fantasy mode, which is a slightly more difficult version where, like, the enemies are are stronger. Mm -hmm. And I think there maybe is some, like, it claims there's new content and items to get as well, so I'm not quite sure what's going on with that. But um, it's a long game, and so I don't know (laughs) if I, especially after having just finished it, I, I might need some time before I jump back in but i feel like maybe if you skipped a lot of the side quests and you just like skipped all the cutscenes and dialogue you might get through it fairly quickly but um but yeah I, the uh, there are other trophies where i think you have to like upgrade all the icon abilities and you need in order to do that you need like a ton of ability points I don't know that you can do that in one playthrough. So yeah, there are a couple and in order to platinum it, if you have any interest in doing that, you would have to play it twice. So that's a little bit of a bummer, but uh, yeah, I really liked it. I think it is a solid game. I like the main character quite a bit as well. Clive. Um, so yeah, I, I, I know that this is not up your alley cause you didn't like the medieval setting of it, but uh, I I recommend it for anyone else. <laughs> well, the other thing we've uh, we're kind of in our what we've playing playing and watching. Um, both of us have seen Oppenheimer. Yeah, what did you think of it? I liked it. Uh, did you see it in IMAX? I did not. The I only got a chance to see it on the normal so not even like the deluxe screen or whatever i saw it in like kind of a fake imax because of course it like costs a bunch of money for a movie theater to have the imax license and say it's officially imax um but i i saw it in a large form factor what they call what is it a plf uh format a premium large format Mm. um so I saw it in extreme screen is what they were calling it on this place. But yeah, it was, uh, I don't know that it needed to be like, I was expecting there to be a reason for it to need to be seen in a large form yeah. factor, but it that did not was, seem like that was super necessary. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. Like, cause the, there was a trailer I saw for that movie, uh, before when I went to see mission impossible. And the trailer was like highlighting, oh, definitely see this on the biggest screen you can find. Mm. And I watched it and I was like, you know, I don't think I need Not to necessary. see it on a bigger screen. <laughs> I think it was fine. I will say the first, uh, probably the first, my favorite part of the movie was the first part where he was like uh, somewhat young and like conceptualizing all of this stuff. And so it was like a lot, a sequence of events where he was a young guy in like England and Europe and he would just be like hanging out and like visualizing these crazy concepts and they would put that to the screen in like really crazy ways uh, with like cool music in the background. And that was made look really cool in the big screen. But that, I, mean, I mean, that's Christopher Nolan's style in a nutshell where it's yeah. like, we're going to have some loud Hans Zimmer music almost uh, drowning out the, the dialogue And we're going to quick cut a lot. And I think sometimes that works because it really builds tension in like later parts of the movie. 
uh, and he puts that to good use in those times. But there are also times like early in the movie, I feel like we were like five, 10 minutes in where he's like already doing that. And it's like yeah. this montage where it's like loud Hans Zimmer music and it's like quick cutting back and forth for different things that Oppenheimer is doing. And it's like, we don't know who this character is yet. And it feels <laughs> like you're giving us a late movie montage as he's like trying to work stuff out. And it's just like, uh, I feel like that's, something that has been a little bit symptomatic of uh, Nolan's more recent movies where he's gotten very into like heavily editing things. And Mm. again, sometimes that really works, Uh, but it is crazy that there would be just dialogue scenes where it would just cut to later in the conversation. Yeah. Well, and it's told in a very nonlinear way. And yeah. he tries to differentiate what time period he's showing you by having some of it in like black and white and some of it in full color. And that di- uh, it didn't always help. I was like, I still yeah. don't know what time period I'm looking at right now. There was a part in the middle where I wasn't sure if we were jumping ahead or not, where I wasn't sure if the bombs had already gone off in Japan Because they were kind of talking about it like, well, what's next? But then it seemed like actually they were trying to pick a place to drop the bombs. And I was like, when is this taking place? Yeah. Um, So in the middle, it got a little muddled, I think. But Were you surprised at all that they didn't have a single scene of like war at all? And they didn't show the, the bombs dropping at all? Yeah, that was surprising to me. It was also surprising... Again, I saw it in that large form factor, and I thought that the actual, like, Trinity test uh, was going to be, like, a super, super wide shot to take advantage of how big the screen is going to be. Mm-hmm. But there never really was that super, super wide shot. It was just, like, I mean, it was impressive, and it was a cool sequence, but, yeah. I, again, I don't think they took advantage of it being on the 70 millimeter. Yeah, that's interesting. Now that I think about it, yeah, they didn't ever go cut to like a super wide shot. To it was, show. if anything, it was a lot of extreme close ups. Yeah, which is a weird strategy for a nuclear bomb test. But yeah, um, yeah other than that, I, I that sequence was pretty cool. I but agree. yeah, it is a, a strange move to not do like a, an extreme wide shot. But I think. Of all of Christopher Nolan's movies that I've seen, it's probably the one I would rewatch the least, just because a lot of it is just courtroom drama. And like I've rewatched yeah. Tenant a, a bunch of times, and I've rewatched Inception a bunch of times. And really? You, uh, so do you understand Tenant? Oh yeah, I fully understand Tenant. <laughs> I was gonna say I I've only seen it once, and I did not fully understand it, and I thought that was his most muddled and confusing movie. I think that one of all of his is the most well. I would I should say I mean, uh, um, what's that first one? Um, not the first one, but um, yeah, Memento but, definitely yeah. also warrants a second watch. But yeah, I think if you watch Tenet another time, it is definitely confusing because you have to like really remember like okay things have already happened so. He, on paper, planned it all out, so it makes sense to him. But, like, to visualize it, you have to watch it a couple of times to be like, okay, this is why this is happening. This is the sequence of events, and this is, like, overlapping. I, but, I don't I don't know if maybe I just go into his movies the first time. Like, I normally end up watching the first, like, my first viewing of a Christopher Nolan movie, at least uh, in his more recent ones, not necessarily his older ones, but his last couple have been like i don't know if i go in with the wrong mindset but i'll you'll start seeing the characters and you're like okay we're definitely going to introduce these people Mm -hmm. and we're going to get a sense of what the scenario is and what they have to work through but that doesn't happen it's like (laughs) it's like walking into a room and before you've even introduced yourself to a person you're like in mid conversation with them and i'm like what is going on here um, and I, like, I know he's kind of doing that on purpose because he likes to do things in a very nonlinear way so that later on in the movie, he can cut back to that scene and be mm-hmm. like, oh, but there was more to it that you didn't know. And this yeah. happened. And isn't it mind blowing? And like, sometimes that works. Uh, but sometimes it's, he overplays his hand a little bit, but I agree. 
Um, but I think if I had to rate them based on my one viewing of each, I would maybe put Oppenheimer ahead of Tenet. Oh, really? But, um, but I mean, Tenet had some cool sequences as well. It was funny. Uh, I, I watched the Red Letter Media review of Oppenheimer, and they were joking about his uh, his style, where it's like loud Hans Zimmer music and quick cutting, even in like um, pretty simple like back and forth, uh, where it's just like dialogue in a room. Mm-hmm. And like I, to his credit, I think that is Nolan's ability to make like what would be a fairly dry scene of just people talking in a room way more interesting yeah. and engaging. Sometimes again, he overplays his hands, but sometimes that uh, works to make what would be a dry scene more interesting. Uh, and the red letter media guys just for fun uh, took that movie. Uh, I think it's called 12 angry men. You remember that movie? Oh yeah. And he, he put like Hans Zimmer music, uh, in the background uh, so loud that you could barely hear what they were saying and <laughs> he just like quit they edited it up so it looked like it was quick cutting all around the room I was like yeah I, <laughs> this is a little bit like the MTV version of movies whereas mm. uh, the old style you could let a let a scene breathe a little bit where a camera shot could be held for longer than like two seconds but <laughs> um but yeah, I, I don't know. I I still liked it overall. Yeah, but, I still liked it. Uh, so I, I would definitely recommend it, but I don't think you have to go see it on a giant screen. Yeah, if you're one of those away. people who are like over the movie theater, like you don't want to deal with... Because definitely like after the pandemic, I was like, yeah, it's 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 good to like be able to pause the movie and go to the bathroom whenever yeah. you want. <laughs> Especially this um, one because it's three hours long. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So if you're, if you're thinking like you don't really want to deal with going to a movie theater, I think it's fine to watch this on a big screen TV. Like I would almost say that like mission impossible is the one where you could go, you should go to the theater as opposed to seeing it on a TV just cause like there's a lot more crazy action that takes advantage of being on a movie screen. Yeah. Yeah. It, it did surprise me that, I don't know if this is a spoiler to say, so maybe if you haven't seen it and you want to skip ahead a little bit, but the uh, the actual bomb test and the like bombing in Japan happens, and there's like another hour after that. Yeah, uh, and it's all politics too. It's politics and people in hearings and that I think is what turned me off of it a little bit. Like, yeah, I I really like things where people are endeavoring to do a goal and they're everyone is like working at the top of their game together. Like it's a, a similar to like in uh, Apollo 13 when like something happens on the spaceship or on the shuttle or whatever. And then you cut back to the engineers at NASA and they like dump a box onto a table and they're like, okay, this is everything they have on the shuttle. We need to turn this somehow into like this thing that will save them. And, like, that stuff is super interesting to me. So, like, leading up to, like, all those scenes where all of the scientists are hanging out and they're like, what if we do this? Or, like, this is an interesting thing. Like, you're on this now. That All that's great. And then it gets to, they did it, but now there's all these, like, hearings. That part was kind of like, I this especially didn't need to be in 70 millimeter. Yeah. And I get that, like, that's part of Oppenheimer's story where, like, he was basically, you know, the father of... Uh, the atomic bomb and then after that because it was like the mccarthy era it like he his name was sort of dragged through the mud Mm. and so he sort of had that period where he had sort of uh you know lost his standing and so i guess they wanted to go through that but in a movie like this they almost could have skipped it entirely and i wouldn't have thought it was a lesser yeah. movie. Because if this was of a it. solid two hours, I think it would have yeah. been an even better movie. Yeah. If they had maybe done a little bit more with the bombs dropping and all of that. And like, I understand they, they also wanted to get to sort of the, uh, the sort of moral ethical quandary of it all. And they do a little bit of that where Oppenheimer's like, you know, he's sort of celebrated for the creation and for the war ending, but also he a little bit has to grapple with the consequence of having dropped a bomb on a big city 
because yeah. they, they have that scene where he's like sitting in a room and there's like a slideshow of like the after effects of the bomb and he's like not even able to look at the the mm. images because it's so disturbing and like so i get they they i understand why they wanted to take the time to do that but yeah the the hearings and everything was a bit much <laughs> um you have put in our notes twisted metal have you i watched the first two episodes of the new twisted metal show on peacock and it's fine i mainly <laughs> am watching it because i i listen to doughboys that uh, fast food podcast and one of the hosts is uh mike mitchell and he is in this oh really um so i am basically just watching it for him um and he's heavily featured in the second episode and i like uh his character I think I will continue to watch it just to see what his character's arc is, but uh, you know, it's not a, it's not something I think I would watch if he wasn't in it. I'll say that um, <laughs> Anthony Mackie is very charming, and I think he's trying to do like a like a young Will Smith and like the uh what's it like uh Men in Black era where he's just like he's in a serious situation, but he's always cracking jokes, kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Um, the tone is a little bit all over the place. Um, I, I'll watch more of it before I like render a final verdict. But I do like that uh, Mike Mitchell's in it, and his his character is cool. Um, so I'll continue to watch it and report back. Uh, so not necessarily something I need to rush out and watch. No, it's on Peacock, which probably I mean, do you even have Peacock? No. <laughs> yeah. I would so, say if you are going to get Peacock, definitely. I talked about this when I was watching it on the podcast, but um, that Paul T. Goldman is probably the best thing on Peacock, um, which is just like a limited series that's very, very interesting. Um, and that MacGruber show was also on Peacock, which I thought was just weird and funny. But in general, there's not a ton. Oh, and uh, Poker Face is on uh, Peacock. But in general, there's not a ton of stuff on peacock i mean you get the back catalog obviously of like old nbc stuff but yeah i was gonna it's say not one you really I, need they, to get they pulled the office over from netflix to peacock oh did they i, I, I think they thought that that was going to be like a big oh now everybody's gonna drop netflix and come over because a lot of there was a long time there where a lot of people including myself a little bit basically only maintain their netflix subscription so that they could watch the office um and i saw a video like just this last week, I think, where some guy was talking about how uh, it feels a little bit like The Office, like the the hype around that show, you know, how it sort of built after mm. the, the series ended mm-hmm. and it became this huge like cultural thing and like had so much uh, like hype and love around it after it ended because it was on Netflix and it became this huge deal. And he's like, I think that's dying down now in part because it left Netflix and is now on Peacock and nobody mm. subscribes to Peacock. Uh, but the other part of that is that it became one of those things where it was so big that now people kind of resent it a little bit because it, it became like a thing where everybody talked about how much they love the office. And it, it's a little bit of a stereotype now. So. You know, what's crazy. I heard a crazy statistic because another show I'm watching right now is what we do in the shadows on FX, which is still great. Oh, did that come back? Yeah, it's still great. Uh, I think it's had three episodes so far. No, four episodes actually. Man, I need but to watch that. I was, I saw like an interview or something with the guy who plays the energy vampire in that, <laughs> who was also in the office. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, I have I made I currently make more money from The Office than I've made in like all five seasons of What We Do in the Shadows because of like how residuals work. Man, that's and crazy. And he was only in The yeah. Office for like a couple episodes, but for whatever reason, because it was on like terrestrial TV or whatever, he still like makes bank off of that as opposed to What We Do in the Shadows, which is primarily on streaming. That's crazy. Yeah, he was uh, like a pretty small side yeah. character in the office, like sort of off and on over the years. And yeah, that's crazy. It's crazy. That he, he's like a featured player in <laughs> what we do in the shadows. <laughs> that's crazy. But, um, anything else you you want to hit before we get to your parting wisdom? Um. I did watch the first episode of an old 90s anime called Initial D. Have you ever heard of that? 
No. My friend recommended it to me. It's on Crunchyroll. Um, it's it's very funny. Like it's a good premise for a show. I think that it's just, it's about like street racing. So everyone's like super into cars. Um, but like all of the cars are super awful early '90s CGI. So you'll get this like really nicely illustrated like two people talking scene, and then they'll be like, "Oh my god, look at that cool car!" And then it's just like. <laughs> Uh, uh, almost a clip art version of a 3D car going down the road, um, which is very funny. I might watch more of that. But other than that, I haven't really been watching much more or playing much more. Yeah. Um, hopefully I'll get a chance to play more Pikmin 4 and have like deeper thoughts on it next week. And then I think next week is uh, Baldur's Gate. You think you'll pick it up? You know, I I am getting more and more to the point where I think I might just because people keep talking about how great it is. And I do have a lot of nostalgia for Baldur's Gate 2. Um, maybe I will. I don't know. I think he should. And then we should talk about it on the show next week. Perhaps I will. Uh, on that note, why don't you hit us with your parting wisdom? On TikTok, I have been getting a lot of videos of this guy who I don't follow yet, but I just like I watch all of his videos at like their in their entirety, so I think he's just getting recommended to me a lot. But he's doing a thing where he's going to like every restaurant. He lives in California. Uh so he's going to every restaurant that has like Mexican style food and ordering just a bean and cheese burrito. And they all look so good. Um so my advice to you is to Go get a bean and cheese burrito from somewhere because it looks really good. <laughs> uh, what what place would you recommend? They're not a sponsor, no matter which one you say. So you know that's a great question. Um, the one he got from Del Taco, which unfortunately is not in the Midwest; it's only in California. It looked really crazy because they put fries in it because it's a California thing. <laughs> so it was like fries and beans and cheese, and it looked actually really delicious. That is crazy. I mean, I would go get, like, a bowl of some sort, like, which is basically a burrito, but in a bowl with lettuce Mm -hmm. instead of uh, the tortilla from, like, a Panchero's or... Oh, yeah. uh, Have you been to Moe's? No, they opened up right after I was leaving, and I never have gone to one. Oh, they didn't make, didn't we know someone who got like food poisoning from there? Oh, that's right. Yeah, we somebody we worked with like went on like opening day basically and tried. Maybe that's it why I never got, got it. Sick. Uh, I feel like you wait at least a week or so after a new <laughs> restaurant opens before Probably you go idea. try it. Yeah, uh, but no, they're they've been fine since because we've eaten there a bunch of times and it's that's good. It's worth checking out for sure i will check it out maybe there's one next to me yeah you might be able to basically make a bean and cheese burrito but with a lot of other things in it a burrito place that i really like but there's not one close to me unfortunately is qdoba Um, oh yeah i wish i could eat there more but there's not like a a, a, an adjacent one to me unfortunately (laughs) that's the real question is which of these uh burrito places is the best where you've got pancheros Kidoba and Moe's and what what's the other one that I'm always Chipotle playing? Chipotle I will say I love Chipotle but they I think are not what you're gonna want if you're gonna want a bean and cheese burrito because they don't have refried beans oh that's true well don't they have they each sort of have their own like special type of like meat or meat substitute of some sort yeah i really like the sofritas at uh chipotle because it's like pretty you don't really need to get the spicy salsa if you get the sofritas because it's already pretty spicy um but it's really good it's like yeah like a kind of a tofu thing yeah i think i like that as well last time i had it i was like ooh, i don't know why i would go with anything other than this. yeah because it's, it's like excellent. yeah like you said it's already it's pre-spiced basically it tastes very good uh, on that note, why don't you go ahead and follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and I was going to say Twitter, but I guess it's X now. X. So yeah, follow us on all those things. Uh, leave this podcast a rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and we'll catch you on the next one. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.